Paul, I'm so excited to talk to you today about a really a hot topic that is an ancient topic that has gone through ups and downs and it's now becoming a topic that people are very, very interested in and it's going into trials in some of the researchers in third phase clinical trials and that is psychedelics. So I am thrilled to be talking to you about this and to first of all, tell us about you and about third wave and your role there. Yeah. So Caroline, thank you so much for, for having me on the podcast and, and getting deep into psychedelics, which you know, for many people were previously a mysterious sort of, you know, voyage into, into what, what are these substances and drugs? And, and now as, as, you know, Michael Pollan's book came out, yeah. the DA clinical trials, so good, there's yeah. just so much more light being shown on these incredibly ancient and powerful medicines. So in terms of my background and my- and I may interrupt mm-hmm. you one second. I'm so glad you mentioned Michael Pollan because my audience is familiar with him because I wrote a book on food and I talk a lot about Michael Pollan oh, cool. and his book was fantastic. So I'm so glad you started with that book. And I'm so glad you said that, you know, it's had, it's got ancient history, but there is now modern, really good modern research coming up. So thank you for saying that. Sorry to interrupt you. Well, and even that's sort of where my psychedelic story starts. You know, I'm 20 and- I started to work with mushrooms and LSD with some sort of intention and responsibility. I grew up in, in West Michigan, close to a small city, Grand Rapids, which is known as the furniture capital yeah. of, 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 of the States. And, you know, the, the type of family and environment and culture that I grew up in is more, I would say, traditional. My mom encourages me, you know, when I've had conversations with her, not to use the word conservative. <laughs> because we're not conservative, but my family itself was was quite traditional. And yeah, so that okay. meant that we followed the rules and that there were certain things that were bad and there were certain things that were good and, you know, quite quite a religious household, church yeah. every Sunday, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, I as an individual, even in my, you know, early adolescence was always very stubborn, do as I wish, you know, independent thinking, sort of a bit rebellious, you know, I didn't like to follow rules, a lot of these sorts of things. And so when I first started to work with cannabis, I was 16 and had my first few experiences with cannabis, thought, hey, this is really interesting. It wasn't quite what they told me in the D.A.R.E. programs. So what's going on here? And and started to kind of explore, you know, illegal drugs in that way. And then when I was 19, had the opportunity to work with with LSD for the first time. And I was I was at a fairly precarious position. I was, you know, coming out of my teenage years, beginning to be a junior in college at that time, was starting to think about what do I want to make the rest of my life? What do I want to do for my 20s? You know, what type of profession, career am I going to pursue? And, you know, there's a Steve Jobs quote that really, I think, embodies my own perspective and pursuit as a result of psychedelic use, which, you know, Steve Jobs, when he did LSD back in the 70s, said, you know, LSD taught me something very important. And that is the most important thing that I can do with my life and my energy is to infuse things back into the lineage of history and to mm, create something so beautiful that, that lasts beyond my, my, you know, my, my more temporal mm, I love existence. This. And, so, and so when I had those early psychedelic experiences, you know, one of the I think most healing aspects of working with in particular high doses of psychedelics is, is overcoming our fear of death. Because when we have this peak experiences with psychedelics, we essentially, the ego drops away, you know, the illusion that we are this, this infinitesimal individual sort of drops away. And we realize that like death is nothing to be scared of. And so many things in our culture and so many actions and behaviors stem from that fear of death, that yeah. holding on too too tight to you know reality as it is. So I think when I was able to sort of see through the veil in that way, I I made the commitment and made the decision that I would spend my twenties, you know, doing something more unconventional and, and essentially, you know, contributing to humanity in such a way that that would help us to overcome the existential crisis that we were going through. Because even ten years ago, it was, it was fairly clear, you know, that climate change was an issue, Problem. mental mm-hmm. health was becoming worse and worse. Mm -hmm. And when I had those psychedelic experiences, I was like, I feel so connected to the world around me and the earth around me that I almost feel that pain and then took on that responsibility of, well, what can I do in my own power? What agency do I have? What choice do I have to actually shift and change culture so that it becomes something that's much more sustainable and healthy. And so mm. th- the path that I pursued was wide and varied. I lived in Turkey for a year right after school where I taught English. Soon after that, I moved to Chiang Mai in Thailand where I bootstrapped and started my first online business. And then after that, moved to Lisbon, Portugal, 
where essentially I started to really build the third wave into the platform that it now is. And initially it started as a hobby project. I was running my other business and that was more the income generator. Mm -hmm. This is back in 2015 that I started third wave. So about five years ago. And then microdosing, you know, I focused a lot on microdosing. It continued to grow in prominence. There were more podcasts and media published about it. I self-published a book. We built a microdosing course. I started to do a lot of public talks. So then, you know, end of 2017, early 2018, was speaking at a number of conferences. And from those conferences, noticed that, oh, you know, a lot of people don't have a legal, safe, medically supervised place to work with high doses of psychedelics. This was right before Michael Pollan's book came out in May 2018. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so with a co-founder of mine who is Dutch, you know, I'm American, he was Dutch. We launched Synthesis piloted three different cohorts of retreats in 2018. And then since that point in time, Synthesis has done retreats for over 700 people wow. who have come in to work with high doses of psilocybin. So, you know, the, the focus professionally, as I sort of envisioned when I was 19 and 20 was from a professional perspective, what's the you know, most significant impact that I can bring to the world to shift consciousness in enough time so that we can start to really deal and face this existential crisis. And for me, the, the modality that I happened to choose was, was psychedelics. I think partly because of my rebellious nature, you know, they, 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 they have been and still are largely illegal. You know, there's more and more research coming out on them. Obviously, Michael Pollan's book is very, yeah. very helpful, the media, the podcast, but still it's worth emphasizing that in most places, they are still very illegal. Yeah. And so I think that's part of, of the continued work is there's more and more stigma that's sort of coming off of psychedelics, more research coming out. So how do we just continue this sort of evolution of the third wave to ensure that these, these substances become integrated in, in a very responsible and intentional way? Great. Fantastic. That's an excellent introduction. Excellent overview. So just for my audience, because I have a very broad audience, I think a great place to start would be just to maybe define what a psychedelic is. And we can dig deep with the actual objective of using psychedelics, because a lot of people would associate them with a hippie era. I mean, let's face it, and illegal drugs. And you've kind of mentioned that already. And, it's, and they have had bad press and they have been used incorrectly. So in many different, like most things, you know, out there, things can be used incorrectly. So if you would wouldn't mind just starting with a big a sort of broad picture overview of that. And then we can dive a little deeper into just a bit of the science as well. My audience is very, they loves the science. So we can maybe get into the epigenetics and the neuroplasticity, and maybe I can relate that back a bit to my research and that'll help people put this very useful tool for helping bring Eastern and Western medicine together so that we can treat the whole person. And there's another op option that we can keep our minds open. So I ask my audience now just to keep their minds open as they learn from you. And hopefully, you know, with all of the media and the press and the research, I'm sure this isn't the first time that, that many, many of your, your audience is hearing exactly, about this. And I think sure. this is an opportunity just to like really dive deep into, into well, what are these compounds? And yeah. I think the best place to start with that is, is the word psychedelic itself. You know, Good so the text. word psychedelic, it comes from two Greek words, psyche and, and delos. Psyche is the mind. Delos is this sort of idea of manifestation of, of creation. So even though the word psychedelic means mind manifesting, and that was mm, invented. I love that. Yeah, mind manifesting. It was invented in the 1960s in a series of letters between Aldous Huxley the famed British writer and a guy mm -hmm. named Humphrey Osmond, who was a Canadian and, and an early evangelist in the 1960s for the psychedelic movement. And so that, that concept... fascinating. An evangelist from the 1960s. That's so interesting. I read that in some way that you wrote. So that's fascinating. I'm so glad you brought that up. So this concept of psychedelic mind manifesting, you know, yeah. I, I think the best way to think about it is these substances whether they're plant medicines like ayahuasca and mm -hmm. San Pedro and Iboga or, if, or psilocybin mushrooms, or if they're more molecules like MDMA and ketamine mm -hmm. and psilocybin and ibogaine, and we can talk a little bit about those mm -hmm. differences, what's mm -hmm. the difference between a plant medicine and a molecule. Regardless, what they often do is they, they enable things to come up from the subconscious and the unconscious that have often been repressed or forgotten about. And for a lot of people, 
you know, all of us have dealt with trauma of some yeah. sort. And so what psychedelics help us do is they help us to basically through like an act of catharsis, right? So all, you know, I, I like this idea of what Jung talked about with the shadow mm. and the shadow are often parts of ourselves that are unacknowledged, that are unloved, that are in the dark, that we're not aware of. And what psychedelics often do is they, they turn a light into that shadow to help us become more aware of the things that we have oppressed, the emotions, the memories, the stories that are influencing our behavior and that we're not aware of. And so in bringing those into light, we become aware of them and we can heal them. We heal them through therapy. We heal them through forgiveness. We heal them through you know, yoga, meditation, sitting with them, re- re-experiencing them within a safe container, allowing the body to feel the fear and, and whatever else needed to be felt to release it and to finally come back to a place of wholeness without carrying that same baggage with us again and again and again. And so I think that, I mean, and obviously based on the specific psychedelic you're using, MDMA is going to be different than psilocybin, which will be different than ayahuasca. But the commonality that all of them share is they allow you to access parts of yourself that were previously just not available. And so that's where I think the, the, one of the, you know, the real power of psychedelics comes in. Okay, so the question that I first, thank you, that's an excellent explanation. So the question I have, or the comment question, is that the the work that I do is in mind management. So I've researched the the non-conscious mind extensively and developed theories on the non-conscious mind. So I talk about the non-conscious, subconscious, and conscious mind. And I know it's, a lot of people refer to that as the unconscious, the non-conscious. But so that's, you know, it's non-conscious and unconscious are actually a little different. But the way I teach it is through mind management. So through a lot of conscious, deliberate intentional thinking you access the non-conscious and you find exactly how you've described you you've got to get that stuff out and it's painful and whatever and whatever and, and then manage that process the way i see in here correct me if i'm wrong the way i see it here is that people can be stuck and i've seen this in, in i practice clinically for 25 years as a communication pathologist and cognitive neuroscientist so i looked at things from a medical and therapeutic level and i'd work with people in all kinds of trauma as well as with brain building and learning and that kind of stuff so an interesting combination that i would see in in people. And what I do now, currently my work is write books and teach on how to do this mind management. So here's the the, the, the the sort of link that I'm trying to make is that I teach people to do this very consciously and deliberately and through neuroscientific techniques and, and through neuroscience and clinical trials, we can see what's happening in the brain. And we can see that, for example, the different energies of the brain, like your alpha data beta, et cetera, change as the non-conscious mind is accessed. So you want to learn to listen to the, the signals of the subconscious in order to get into the non-conscious, to have that deep spiritual experience. And it's only when you get that connection that you're actually going to be able to then draw it up and do something about it. So it's I've said the same thing you said, but I'm, I'm teaching it through conscious cognitive activities. You never just do conscious. You always do non-conscious. Non-conscious operates 24-7. You're just bringing them together. I see psychedelics, EMDR, all these kinds of things. But psychedelics are seem to be a little bit more effective or quicker in the process of breaking through because there have been some subjects in my, in my trials and patients where it's very it, it takes it's so scary for them to go there that it's it's really it takes years for them to have the courage to pull them up and and the mind management works I mean the changes are phenomenal so if I understand correctly it's not a panacea nothing is ever a panacea like you can't you can't say psychedelics or EMDR or any one way is a panacea obviously you've got to find a combination of things and you mentioned already breathing and meditation and yoga and all these things can help us but psychedelics add that extra value if do they add that extra value or extra component that we can break through into the non-conscious and in a safer space pull it up in a shorter period of time deal with that core thing that holds people back this toxic thing that is so the longer it stays there the more to- the more brain damage it does the more it affects the, because of neuroplasticity and the more it impacts on every area of your life so we want to get it out and we can do that I, I mean I'm not in favor of years and years of talk therapy either because it just goes on forever and even people talk themselves in a hole so my techniques are also very direct to get let's get in let's get it out let's get moving forward but I see psychedelics working hand in hand actually with this technique in, in cracking that egg open if that's a good way of saying it because I see one of my subjects and then I'll be quiet and you can please take it away from there and, and see if I'm understanding it correctly one of uh-huh. my my most recent clinical trials one of our subjects was in such a bad place but like really his life was just falling apart he he was also in a job where he was forced to be in a lot of social contact with people and he hated that and it was totally against his personality so from every aspect this guy was falling apart his life his marriage everything and he didn't last in the trial 
smile. Because he's one of the ones that fell out early on when we started getting him to do the work. And I was immediately thinking he would have been perfect for that. So that to do the psychedelic intervention where we could help him break through and bring that up so that you can then do the additional work that is a lifestyle. Okay. Am I understanding the use of psychedelics totally incorrectly or correctly? Correctly. And so I think let's let's go a little bit deeper into that okay. to, to provide more context for the audience. So there's a well-known addiction psychiatrist. His name is Dr. Gabor Mate. Gabor Mate has been working with addiction for 30, 40 years. And in particular, he's been working with ayahuasca as a medicine for addiction for the last 10 to 15 years. And he has a very sort of famous saying now in the psychedelic space, which is that an ayahuasca experience is like 10 years of therapy in a single night for yeah. all of the reasons that you're mentioning. And I think, you know, one analogy that that Michael Pollan talks about in his book is that of the default mode network. Yes, and yes, so I do a lot we, of work on that too, yeah. Yep, so when we have that default mode network, when we have that sort of rigidity in our brain, when we become over rigid, that's what can lead to depression. And so what psychedelics do is they essentially interrupt the default mode network, they depattern the default mode network to create some openness, to create that sort of chaos. And then with that openness, right, that window of neuroplasticity that's being introduced because of psychedelics, it becomes much easier to weave in new behavioral change that then will lead to a much more nourishing lifestyle over the long term. So the way that I always love to talk about it when it comes to psychedelics is like psychedelics are not a magic pill. You know, they're not just going to like, you take a psychedelic and you're fixed. What's going to happen when you work with a psychedelic, especially in a therapeutic container or any sort of container that is safe, that is sacred, where there's an intention put in, where it's clearly meant for a psychedelic experience, that container is so critical, there will be an opening in that container where you will start to understand there will be things that come up from the subconscious and the unconscious. There will be things that, that need to be processed. There will be things that, that are released, right? There will be a catharsis of sorts mm -hmm. of repressed mem memories, emotions, trauma, et cetera, et cetera. And so there's so much that can come up in those experiences that it can be difficult to manage. It can be yeah. difficult to process. And that's why it's so critical that in working with psychedelics as a catalyst, as an opener, that not only do you have to pay attention to the container in which you're doing it, making sure that it's safe, making mm -hmm. sure that the set and setting is ideal. You know, if it's your first time, you're not that experience of a guide, a sitter, a therapist who is there with you to bring you through the psychedelic experience. But what becomes even more critical is the integration process, because a lot of people will have the sort of what 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 might be called a mystical experience when they have when when they work with psychedelics you know they have this experience that is incredibly profound that is incredibly meaningful one of the most you know sort of just nourishing and enriching experiences of their lives where it's literally like before i did psychedelics and after i did psychedelics wow. but the the concern not the concern but the the danger of that is that a lot of people will just keep going back into that. So, you know, there's stories mm. of people who have been working with ayahuasca for 25 years, for example. They do ayahuasca every month or every two months or they keep going to the circles. And you look at them and you're like, well, you, but you haven't changed in 25 years. So you, mm -hmm. keep doing okay. the, you keep doing the medicine, but, but you're, you're not, not actually... doing the work to change, yeah. Exactly. And so then the integration process is really like 70 to 80 to 90 percent of it. It's not necessarily like, let's not put the entire onus on taking the psychedelic itself. It's just the but catalyst say, that opens the it's, door. It's the catalyst that opens mm -hmm. a door. And then it's and then it's what you do with that material afterwards that matters, which is why mm -hmm. it's so important to do it with a therapist who you can work with for the next four so to good. six to eight weeks, because then that opening which would normally be covered up by the ego and the rigidity and the unwillingness of the subconscious to change, right? It's just, it's broken open. And then the therapist can actually work with that material to sort of point you in the right direction and guide you and mirror to you, oh, like this is something you should consider and this is something you should be aware of. And, and, and then that's where we actually see the significant changes. It's, it's what are you doing for the, the week after? What are you doing for the month after? What are you doing... For the, three for the to lifestyle, four yeah, the lifestyle after that, okay. 
And the analogy that I always love to use when talking about psychedelic experiences is it's like when we go to the dentist, right? Every six months, most of us will go to the dentist, we'll get a significant checkup, we'll get a deep clean, we'll make sure that, you know, the the, the, the our dental hygiene is clean as possible. And then every day between those dentist appointments, we brush our teeth, we floss, we use our mouthwash, you know, we're, 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 we're having that daily consistent. There's a consistent maintenance. Yeah. There's a consistent maintenance. And so when it comes to psychedelics, right? Psychedelics are that experience where the clouds part and you see the mountaintop, you see the vision of where your life is going. You see this ideal of what you're becoming. And then of course, after the psychedelic experience, it's about putting one step one foot in front of the other, taking a step-by-step up the mountain and just doing the work consistently. And so that means starting a meditation practice. And that means consistently doing maybe something like breath work or going to yoga. It could mean slightly changing your diet. So maybe going onto a ketogenic diet or maybe eating less processed foods. It could be quitting smoking. It could be, you know, cutting off toxic behaviors. It could be, you know, moving to a new place. You know, obviously the, the ranges of behavioral changes are, are almost infinite. infinite. Yeah, infinite. But what matters is that you're actually starting to take steps in your life after the psychedelic experience that feel nourishing, that feel enriching, that feel like, okay, this is helping me to become you know, a, a more whole person where I don't need to be fragmented anymore. I don't need to feel like I need to forget things or repress things or cut things off, but that I can become a fully integrated individual. Okay, beautiful. Okay, so we're talking the same language. I really get that. That's a beautiful combination, those two, that conversation we've just had, your input and, and just putting it together. So for my audience, I talk about mind management, which is a result of these 38 years of research I've done on mind brain. And it's pretty much saying, I don't use the psychedelics, but I'm, as I mentioned, I'm using teaching people mind management. So it's kind of like the post that you're talking about once the clouds have opened and you see the mountain, and now you've got to actually maintain the sustainability of keeping go up the mountain, go down the mountain, go up the next mountain. So you've got to keep on living. You've got to have the mind management to choose the behavior changes, to sustain the behavior changes. And whatever those, whatever, as you said, they're infinite. And so mind management is going to sustain that process, but you've got to first open the door. So psychedelics are a very powerful way of doing that. How do they compare then to something like EMDR, which is also pretty effective? Talk, talk therapy, psychotherapy, those are all part of more the maintenance afterwards. And, I, and from the research that I've done, and this is your expertise, but it appears that those work more effectively post some kind of dramatic thing like psychedelic intervention or EMDR, which is not as dramatic, but it's got a similar kind of objective. But those, but just to go straight into talk therapy, people get stuck there for years and years. That's always been my argument against traditional talk psychotherapy going on and on. And, and CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, you just whacking a plaster on the wound. You can't just use techniques to change your life. You actually have to do the work of reconcept, embracing, processing, reconceptualizing before you move on. Okay. So my question is, how's the psychedelic experience before we dive into the detail of them different to something like EMDR as like this trigger, this catalyst, this parting of the clouds, this cracking of the egg, whatever you want to, whatever analogy we use. You know, I think the, the core difference between psychedelics and almost any other modality is just the, the intensity of it. Okay. You know, there's Very there's good. a there's a there's a fantastic podcast by Sam Harris, who's who's a famed mm-hmm. writer and neuroscientist, yeah. and public intellectual. And the very first episode of his podcast that he released is is an essay called "The Meaning of Drugs." And in that essay, he basically outlines like, you know, if you meditate and you sit and meditate for ten or fifteen minutes, something might happen, but it's not guaranteed. If you do some breath work, you know, something might happen, and but it's not guaranteed. But if you take five grams of psilocybin mushrooms, something is going to happen. And so the, 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 the beautiful thing with psychedelics is for almost everyone, again, there are always rules. There are always exceptions to certain rules. And we need to talk everyone, about that as well. We need to talk about that environment and everything as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm, and we will do that. But for almost everyone, if you take five grams of psilocybin mushrooms, you're going to have an experience. Now, the, the quality of that experience and the nature of that experience will depend on a lot, uh, you know, a lot on set and setting and how you prepare and the safety of the container, et cetera, et cetera. But you will have an experience. And I think that's what is different from psychedelics compared to almost any other modality is the predictability of the intensity in which you dive into your subconscious and your unconscious. And of course, this is why they have remained illegal for so long. This is why they are such 
touchy subjects because they're so easy they to mismanage. Intense. Intense. They're so and they're so to easy to mismanage. And I think it's that mismanagement that has given it such a bad name. But it's like anything. You know, if you think of it, if you go for surgery, you have to have an anesthetic. Otherwise, it's going to be a little sore. But you don't keep on taking the anesthetic on a continual basis. So it's for that immediate time being. And if we, if, if I'm understanding you correctly, we need to see it. We need to see psychedelics in the time frame in a different way and in a different time frame. It's not something that you're just going to keep on doing forever and a daily thing. It's, it's, a, it's a moment in time that starts a process. And the process has to be very driven by the person. Okay, so the difference there then is it's much more intense. You will have an experience and that's great. It can also be very scary for people. So they do need to be mentally prepared for the fact that they will have an experience. Can you talk a little bit about that then in terms, because you've said a lot about you've got to do it in the right space and you've got to have the right protective things in place. What does that look like? That's a great question. So, you know, as part of a psychedelic experience, there there are three main elements to pay attention to. So one is preparation. How do we prepare for the experience? The second one is the experience itself. What's the the container of that experience? Who is the guide for that experience? What substance are you taking for that experience? You know, and there are a few other considerations. And then there's the integration process of once you have that opening, how do you then integrate the insights into your life so that you are living in a way that's more balanced and more whole? And so the way that we set that up, for example, with Synthesis, the retreat center that I started in the Netherlands, as well as with programming that we're doing with Third Wave, is really looking at it as like a six-week chunk, where you have two weeks of preparation, you have the experience itself, and then you have four weeks of integration. And so usually with the two weeks of preparation, Mm. a lot of that is just clarifying intention. What is it that you want to explore? What are behaviors that continue to pop up that feel like they're self-sabotaging? You know, what are traumatic things that have happened to you in the past that you haven't fully processed or come to terms with? So a lot of it is just first sort of journaling into starting to sort of excavate the subconscious and the unconscious to, to, to sort of shine a light in there before you dynamite the whole thing yeah, in a high open. dose of the psychedelic experience. So you want to mm-hmm. start to shine the light there because as I mentioned before, Psychedelics are non-specific amplifiers. So, more, so wherever you're shining a light, psychedelics will act as a microscope. So you can go even more precisely into, well, what's really there? What do I need to uncover? What do I need to excavate? And then you, you're going into that, that sort of priming, if you will, into the high dose of the psychedelic experience, into the container where you're doing five grams of mushrooms or you're doing you know, an MDMA experience or you're walking into an ayahuasca ceremony, right? The, the container is always different. But what matters most for that container is that you feel safe in that container. You know, There is no such thing. There's a, there's a common sort of phrase in the psychedelic space, which is there's no such thing as a bad trip. There are either safe or unsafe experiences. And as long as the experience is safe, then you can surrender to whatever is coming up. Because a lot of the sort of bad trips happen because resistance from the ego starts to sort of poison the experience. And so you want to make sure that you can completely release and surrender to allow whatever needs to come up to come up and then have a guide or a sitter there who can then, as these things are coming up, as these you know, repressed memories, these emotions that you haven't dealt with, you know, certain traumas that you might have to re-experience, as those come up, a professional guide or a sitter can then help you navigate through those throughout the entirety of the psychedelic experience to ensure that those can be processed appropriately. And then after the experience is done, then the real work begins, which is, okay, now you've had these insights, you come to this awareness about who you are, about your past, about your story, about, you know, what means something to you, what, what, what you want to actually hold on to and what needs to be released. And then the the integration process is, okay, well now how do you actually start to integrate these insights and, and, and sort of learning? So like on a personal example, you know, when I was first starting to work with psychedelics, one of the awareness that I came to was that I have a tendency to self-isolate. I have a tendency to, you know, not always be the friendliest to other people. I have a tendency to be, yeah, not necessarily socially awkward, but just a little distant from people. And what I noticed is that was affecting my well-being in a certain way. I, I would I would easily get depressed because I was self-isolating. And so from my early psychedelic experiences, I then became much more intentional about 
communicating with friends, about reaching out, about setting up events, about, you know, giving little mm-hmm. gifts to friends here and there to like help develop closer bonds. So I just started to be much more intentional about, okay, this is what I can sort of do to address what I think is creating suffering in my life. So that, that, that integration process is, is, is phenomenal. You know, a lot of that integration mm. process might be forgiving. So when it comes to, especially people who are sexual assault survivors, like needing to forgive the people who they were assaulted by, that's a huge, huge part of it. And for those who have been in war, you know, a lot of, a lot of MDMA, for example, is being tre- tre- used to treat PTSD from pe- from, for, for war veterans. So a lot of the integration process is learning to love oneself and not blame oneself and, you know, like, like just sort of start to piece that back together. A lot of it is, you know, like, like a core reason for depression for a lot of people is not being able to authentically feel all their emotions and not to authentically mm-hmm. be themselves. So there's a fantastic writer and therapist, Alice Miller, who, who has written about, about this process in terms of the things that happen to us as children, the, 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 the parts of ourselves that we repress because of parenting and because of school and because of jobs and because of all these other things, those parts of ourselves that are fully authentic to who we are need to be re-experienced and reintegrated and refelt. So a lot of integration could just be allowing oneself to feel sad, to feel angry, to feel to integrate shame and or maybe not feel ashamed of, of parts of who we are, right? That, that can be a lot of mm-hmm, integration mm-hmm. as well. And this comes, we, we haven't spoken about this explicitly yet, but this comes to the power of microdosing. So if, if a high dose experience acts as sort of a catalyst, a tremendous catalyst and opening where a lot of stuff starts to come up, then microdosing is a phenomenal way to help to integrate that experience because microdosing helps that window of neuroplasticity, if you will, to stay open for even longer to ensure that you can continue to make behavioral changes you know, in the long term. So I think that that that's a good place to leave off when it comes to microdosing for integration is, as I mentioned before, there are practices that we want to implement after a high dose mm-hmm. of a psychedelic experience that allow us to continue to stay present, to continue to stay grounded, to stay adaptable, to stay you know, with our emotions as they're coming up. And that's where I think microdosing is, is, is phenomenal because it's just, it's, it's, it's another way to cultivate wellness and cultivate health and cultivate stability, you know, all things considered. Okay. So this, this is brilliant. So I understand there's this prep, there's the preparation, which is two weeks. So it's a whole lot of getting ready. You're not just going to dive in and do this. There's a lot of mental preparation that goes into this in terms of everything, you know, the whole mental experience that you're going to go through and the choice of the, the, um, whatever you're going to use, et cetera. Then there's the experience and then there's the integration process afterwards. And the integration process then has this micro dosing component that you with small little doses to keep that window open then you know so then and then from there you've got to go into the constant mind management that you're not just going to stop and it's going to be if you've opened a can of worms it's going to take time after that to to integrate reintegrate and process and re, i call that reconceptualization so i totally understand the process you're embracing processing and reconceptualizing but you're doing it in such a way that it's like people are battling to get there to really deal with that because we also become such a society of suppression where you know 50 years ago it was very it was very much the thing to dive deep into our spiritual nature. And then with the advances of technology and medicine, we've become so neuro-reductionistic. And I mean, I can speak as a neuroscientist that that's what I fought against in my own profession is that that we don't, that, that we can't keep producing. You are not your brain. Your brain is just the, the receptor responder that your mind is working through. Your spirit's a lot bigger than that. Your non-conscious, your mind, we are which you have an unconscious, conscious, subconscious is so much bigger. And that's always going, it's always working. So, you know, your brain's limited. So, and we become expert, we become, we've become in the society expert at suppression, expert at putting it down, expert as soon as someone has sadness, it's treated as an it, and now suddenly you're clinically depressed and it's something like cancer or diabetes. And it's such a wrong narrative. And that's why I think it's contributed to the increase in mental health problems. It's not so much that mental health has actually increased, it's the management, it's the mismanagement has been a big issue. People haven't been allowed to experience their experiences and haven't had safe places to experience or haven't been prepared to experience and then integrate afterwards, as you so 
Kev beautifully put that. And I think now there's a shift back, and I've watched this for 38 years. I've watched people going from this, this sort of period where they're sort of shifting out of the deep spiritual exploration into the more medical approach, biomedical approach. And now there's a shift back again. And I think psychedelics, that's probably why psychedelics now have become so much more available for people or now are going into clinical trials. And there's some that are third trial, third stage, third stage of trials with the FDA. These are safe when they're controlled carefully. It's a safe way of helping people to get out of this. There's something wrong with me if I feel depressed. Depression's not an it. Depression is simply a signal that there's something going on and you need to find it. And that something going on is toxic. And so society is suppressed. And as humans, we don't like pain. So we push it down too. And whatever you, you talk about neuroplasticity, neuro, there's the neuroplasticity paradox, which is that your brain's always changing. You always you are always neuroplastic. So it's either in a positive or negative direction. And so you may as well direct the direction. And which is a lot of the work that I do is try and help people with directed neuroplasticity that you have more control than you realize. And if you don't actually direct it, it's still changing, but in the wrong direction, you know. And so I see psychedelics as a fantastic tool and way of of helping people to cross that hump, to open that door, to get rid of that suppression, to give themselves the freedom to be able to shift and make the change. Can you talk, uh, I mean, I'm just, this is just my, my observations of what you've been saying and everything. I understand and relate to it now so much better because of my own work. Okay, so I want to ask you now, let's talk about the different, I've got so many questions. Let's talk about the different types, because you've mentioned quite a few, you said you'd do that earlier on, and how do you make a choice of which psychedelic to use? You know, I'm sure there's some sort of criteria or guideline. So before we had mentioned the the two main kind of substances, you know, we have we have the molecules, Plant based and molecule based, yeah. Yeah, so we have the molecules like ketamine, MDMA, psilocybin, and then we have the plant based ayahuasca, iboga, San Pedro. And so, in terms of the ideal way to work with these substances, everyone has trauma, right? If 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 you're an adult who is living, you know, in 2020. You, your ancestors. I've got a lot of trauma. <laughs> we, have, we have a lot of trauma, you know, like, and so I think the first step for everyone is to first process that trauma and to work with that trauma and to understand that trauma. And there is no better tool that we have for that than MDMA. So MDMA is the ideal tool to work with trauma. And, and the reason for that is because MDMA does a fantastic job of quieting the amygdala. And when the amygdala, that fight or flight response is dampened, then we can much better recall traumatic things that have happened to us. Because oftentimes when we want to recall traumatic experiences, the amygdala tightens up, we get very anxious and we can't release them. We can't have that catharsis. And so by quieting the amygdala and dampening it, we can actually talk about these experiences. And the other great thing about MDMA is as, any, as anyone who has done MDMA before, and attest to, it's basically impossible to have a difficult trip and experience with MDMA. It's almost always a very beautiful, blissful, heart-opening, empathic experience. In fact, this is why MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, has focused on medicalizing MDMA for PTSD mm -hmm. because MDMA is such a soft and warm heart opener. So that I think for mm -hmm. most people is a great starting point to work with trauma and to deal with trauma. That's the one that's in the third stage of clinical trials, isn't it? The for PTSD, yeah. Yeah, correct. For PTSD. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then once we've sort of dealt with that trauma and worked with that trauma and understand that trauma, then it makes much more sense to work with a substance like psilocybin or LSD. So there's this, this phenomenal analogy, which a prominent MDMA therapist has discussed when it comes to working with psychedelics, which is, you know, when we're looking to invest in ourselves when we're kind of on a path of becoming, on a path of healing, on a path of, you know, what are we flowering into? To think of ourselves as a lotus flower, which I think is beautiful as yeah. an analogy, right? The lotus flower is the sort of pinnacle mm -hmm. of flowers. And so for a lotus flower, for a lotus flower to fully blossom and flourish, you first have to pay attention to the soil and to ensure that the soil is, is tilled, that it's healthy, that it's healed. That's the MDMA in dealing with the trauma. Then you as the person, as the consciousness, you are the seed that's planted in that mm -hmm. soil, right? And because you're, you have a healthy base now, you're planted in that soil. And then the psilocybin or LSD is the stem that grows from the soil. 
And that's sort of the, the, the growth of the individual, the beginning of the process mm. of opening up more and more and more. Because LSD and psilocybin, because they are classic psychedelics, they help us to become more aware of our shadow side. MDMA allows us to process trauma, but it doesn't necessarily get us to shine a light into all of our crevices to understand mm. all parts of ourselves. So it's a more gentle opening of the door. A much more gentle opening. And then the other one started, as you said, showing the, 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 I can never say that word. The shadow. Uh, No, shadow. Psilocybin. 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 And the psilocybin. It took me like a year. It took me like a year to figure out how to pronounce it. Yeah, psilocybin and and the other one. LSD. Those are the ones that are, get, start looking at the shadow side. So you start seeing some of the the scary, the uncomfortable, the the, the sad, the depression, the, the scary stuff. The scary stuff, right? The, the stuff that makes us human and the yeah, stuff that we need to... Part the, of our story. The, the dark parts of ourselves that need love and that need compassion. And by no means are, are these experiences only difficult. They're also beautiful and incredible exactly. and, and bring us to incredible states of being that are beyond consciousness, that are beyond normal everyday waking consciousness. It's a spiritual, it's a spiritual experience. It's a spiritual awakening. Yeah. Because the thing is with MDMA, MDMA, it's subtle enough that you're not going to like think you're God. You're not going to have this deep, deep, you might have a, you'll probably have a, a spiritual experience, but you're not yeah. going to like, it, it's just, it, it's hard to describe, but it's, it's fundamentally different than psilocybin or LSD. Psilocybin or LSD start to open those neurochemical keys to, to connect you to this higher source of being. And so once you've started to work with those, you feel comfortable with those, you've sort of, sort of shined a light on the various parts of yourself, then the sort of flower on top that's flourishing is something like ayahuasca or something like 5-MeO-DMT or something like San Pedro, which are the plant medicine experiences, sort of the, the, the creme de la creme experiences. Mm-hmm. And so the issue for a lot of people is a lot of people jump right in with ayahuasca or they jump right in with San Pedro or they jump right in with 5-MeO-DMT. And the, the, the not so great part of that is oftentimes people will have these enlightening experiences and opening experiences, but it's so messy that it becomes mm-hmm. difficult to actually root out the trauma, to understand the trauma, to heal the trauma. So, so it's more just like if you start right away with something like ayahuasca, you just bulldoze through your entire history and psyche, which... Quick. Mm. Can heal stuff, but it also can leave a lot of... Can leave of, another trauma in its wake, yeah, because it's exactly. too quick. Exactly, detritus, yeah. a lot of detritus. Mm-hmm. So it's much better to to clean out the detritus with the MDMA, with the LSD and the psilocybin. And then mm. once you feel like you can fully release and surrender into an experience like ayahuasca or 5-MeO-DMT to go with those those sort of high-level, you know, master plants. Okay, so your first level is then just more of a gentle awakening. The second one gets a little bit into the shadowlands, and the third one is you hit the hard, you hit the hard points. You really hit the hard points. Mm-hmm. So it's very good to have that. So in 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 your six week retreats, do you take people through that that entire cycle? So with it depends, or is it individualized for each person and their needs and so on? Yeah. So with third wave, when, when you know, when, with the six week program that we're doing, it's because MDMA is still illegal. Yeah. Because psilocybin in most places is still illegal. Instead, we lead people through an experience of breath work. Okay. A a, a one and a half to two hour breath work experience Mm -hmm. that they can do at home. And then we lead them through four weeks of microdosing integration. With synthesis, the legal psilocybin retreats in the Netherlands, we would do two weeks of preparation and then the high dose of psilocybin because that is legal. So there are, there are ways. So that's, I would not say not the ideal, ideal, optimal way to do it, but it is in terms of what's legally feasible and what's available right now. Okay. It's still incredibly effective. When MDMA starts to become more available and less illegal, I think that is the route that everyone should be onboarded into and on-ramped into is MDMA, then LSD and psilocybin, then ayahuasca. But this is, just as a caveat, a little bit of, do what I'm telling you to do, not what I did. Because even on a personal level, you know, I've now done the work with MDMA, you know, dealing with trauma. I've also done the work with LSD and psilocybin. I've do- also done the work with ayahuasca, but I've been working with psychedelics for 10 years. And a lot of these best practices are only now starting to come into the light and, and, and come into mm. the awareness. And I think that's the phenomenal opportunity that your listeners have, especially if they've never worked with psychedelics, is 
if they're going to do this, to ensure that they do it in an ideal way. Because what, the, what we don't want to happen, especially as psychedelics gain more popularity, is we don't just want people to sort of come in and do the work willy-nilly, not pay attention to the finer points. Because as I mentioned before, You're gonna as have we a talked back, about... Backlash, yeah. Yeah, you could, well, not only a cultural backlash, but just the individual backlash. That's, yeah. if, we try to, if we try to stretch the ego too far, too mm. quick, you can break as I'm person. sure you've experienced, mm. you can break it. It can, mm. be, it can be very fragile. So that's why I think, in a way, the, 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 the mantra that we like to use with third wave is to start low and go slow. You know, like, mm. like this is a process that even the process that I just outlined, MDMA to psilocybin to ayahuasca, that might be a three to four year process. Mm. You know, that's not going to be something mm-hmm. that happens in just a month. It's not like you're going to do mm-hmm. MDMA and then do mushrooms, and then do ayahuasca right away. That could be a three to four to five year process as it unrolls mm. and unravels. But the important part is just to have patience within that process because I think what we are trained, especially nowadays, is, is for instant gratification. Yes, for quick very much. fixes. Yeah. Right. And and mm-hmm. as you know, no quick there fix. is no quick fix. When it comes to mind, it's no quick stuff. no, none of it. There's no quick and that's fix. that's where the psychotropic industry, and it really is an industry, has promised a lie. It's it's a lie. It's it's you can't just take a tablet and things go away. It's it's you've got to do the work in the process of you know of the mind to and keep your mind as clean as possible. So, so you just, I love that, that progression. I love that, that how you've explained that, that you can't just dive in and expect the quick fix that it goes through a process and MDMA into the, okay, I can't say that word, say it again, the size. Psilocybin. Gosh, psilocybin. That's the second kind of phase. And then the third phase is the Ayahuasca, Ayahuasca, or San Pedro, or, San Pedro. or five Pedro. in the ODMT, okay. some of the, okay. the more intense um, that's plant a three, medicine teachers. So that's a, but that's a three to four year process. So you're not going to whack that into a six week process. It's going to still be very a very gentle process. So I'm very glad we've spoken about this because I didn't want people to get the impression that, oh, okay, I'll go and get one psychedelic high and I'm fixed. It's definitely not the case. This is a case that's very, it's a very serious process and it's a very scientific process. And it's also changing the brain and changing the body. So if you go and do it incorrectly, you can do tremendous damage. And I think that's the bad side of this whole thing that, that the world has been so exposed to in general, the general lay person has been exposed to the, the addiction side, you know, the side where you it, it destroys you in large quantities and used incorrectly, but it actually has so many benefits when used correctly. So it's like anything. And even, and even, and even you know, to speak to that, Caroline, like even the downsides of psychedelics, like they're anti-addictive. So you actually, you can't become addicted to psychedelics. Oh, that's right? great. Like, Say that again, because that's going to be yeah. a question that I can tell you now, that's going to be a question people are going to ask. So thank you. For, yes. I meant to ask you that. So thank you for remembering to say it. This is a huge misconception with psychedelics. Like we think of psychedelics as drugs. And then we think of all these other drugs like cocaine or heroin or even cannabis or tobacco or caffeine, right? Like almost every drug, quote unquote, that we know. Mm-hmm psychoactive is addictive. And those are both legal and illegal drugs. Alcohol mm-hmm. is addictive. Tobacco is addictive. You know, various other, various other, obviously, illegal drugs are also addictive. Psychedelics are not. Psilocybin is anti-addictive. LSD is anti-addictive. Ayahuasca is anti-addictive. In fact, in the clinical trials that they're doing right now, they're exploring the efficacy of psilocybin for alcoholism. Psilocybin for nicotine. Yeah, I saw that. I saw that in some of the writings. That's amazing. That is so fantastic. Psychedelics are not addictive. You know, just talking about addiction, I don't know if you're aware of this, but the modern American diet, the processed food modern American diet, when they did a a study on levels of addiction, it is more addictive than heroin and cocaine. So it's like up there as number two in the addiction list. Sugar Sugar and and, and processed grains. Yeah. And you know, Michael Pollan, he talks so much about that. Yeah. So that the processed fats, salts, and sugars, that is more addictive. And then what is more more damage in the brain than something like heroin and cocaine. And not like I'm not saying go and take heroin and cocaine. Definitely but not. you actually people are totally living immersed in the modern American diet thinking it's all innocent. But actually it's very, very serious. You mentioned cocaine and heroin, people go, oh, but you mentioned the modern American diet as being addictive and people don't even process that. Meanwhile, it is more addictive and you go through withdrawal and it's insidious in its addictiveness because you know it grows on you and it doesn't have that, okay, if you've overdosed on heroin, you're going to see the effects much quicker. But you see the same type of damage happening in the brain over time with a modern American diet and it's harder to actually get. So that's just a little thing 
thing to throw in there. So psychedelics are not addictive and they're using it to actually, in the trials you were saying, to actually help people that battle with alcohol addiction, to actually use it as a way of breaking that addiction and helping. And obviously, if I if I just make two and two, because my approach to any kind of addiction is addiction means consumed by. And if you consume by something, we're designed to be consumed as humans. Although I know because I know you talk a lot about our humanity and 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 love and and connection and collectivism and being a whole person and which is a lot of what I talk about too. We're designed for that. So if we're not getting that from trauma or from whatever we're going through in our life, then we look for something to replace it. And that's generally what an addiction is. So we've got to deal with that the core. So addiction is not a disease. It is just a band-aid on something that's, or a temporary relief on something that's very painful. So I can see psychedelics making huge sense with addiction because it's going to crack open that door of why am I addicted to the alcohol in the first place to find the origin story. If I'm, is that sort of the approach that it would, would well, and it's typically like any addiction, whether it's it's alcohol or tobacco or sex or, you know, sugar or you name the addiction. We usually have addictions to numb ourselves to emotions exactly. that we don't want to feel. Exactly. And so when, when, when we work with psychedelics, we basically sensitize those emotions. We actually feel those emotions for the first time. We can actually process those emotions so we yeah. don't feel this sort of subconscious necessity of continuing to numb ourselves to that pain. Exactly, And that's the great thing about psychedelics. There was a phenomenal paper published out of Imperial College by Robin Carhar Harris, who's one of the leading psychedelic researchers, that showed that's a huge difference between psychedelics and traditional antidepressants. Is traditional antidepressants, because they they work with the 5-HT1A receptor, Mm. they numb, almost all antidepressants numb Mm -hmm. everything. And damage. yeah, and damage the synapses, yeah, the receptors. Mm-hmm. Whereas what psychedelics do is they activate the 5-HT2A receptor. Mm. And the 5-HT2A receptor is tied to adaptability. And essentially what that means is when that is activated, instead of numbing to the pain or numbing to the emotion, what psychedelics do is they help us to bring that emotion into the light to look at it mm, and to understand totally opposite, it. Totally opposite. To integrate in, it. But you're going to feel the pain. You're not going to be numbed. Whereas the depressant, antidepressant exactly. will numb the pain, but it's only temporary and it's doing all the damage to the receptors and the downstream damage is shocking to all the neurochemicals. Whereas the psychedelics not doing that. It's doing the opposite. It's I, activating it to deal with it. It so almost like a catharsis of sorts where it gets it yeah. out and gets it in front of you. And that's why it's so critical and working with especially high doses of psychedelics, that there's a guide or a sitter or someone who is there to hold mm. you in that container mm. as you're facing these very difficult emotions. Because if you don't have that and these really difficult emotions mm. come up, then you could potentially freak out or have a bad trip or yeah. you know do something that isn't so great. And so that's why it's so critical that you have a safe container mm-hmm. in which to face and confront these really difficult and painful emotions that may come up during a psychedelic experience. Mm, so you've got to have someone who's experienced. So that safe person is obviously someone who understands it and who's trained. It's not, so you can't just go get the stuff and sit with each other. You've actually got to sit with a professional. So there's nuance to that. I think there's caveats to that. For mm-hmm. anyone who has significant trauma, who has been clinically diagnosed with depression, addiction, PTSD, anxiety, and it's the first time they're working with psychedelics, absolutely, they need a trained professional who's going to help them with this process. But, you know, when we started synthesis and have done synthesis, we screened out all clinical issues. So with the only people who were attending synthesis, who were people who weren't on antidepressants or didn't have any clinical issues, what we would call maybe healthy normals. And like I mentioned, everyone has trauma. So there would still be difficult things that came up in that process. But it wasn't as intense of a like one person with two therapists. We had a group of 15 people and we had three guides and a couple volunteers who would help to ensure that the space was safe for everyone. So I think mm. that's where it's, it's so context dependent. Everyone's psychedelic experience is so different. And the caveat is if you have deep trauma that you need to process, always do it with a professional. If this is the first time that you're working with psychedelics, if you, you, you don't have any major trauma and you feel generally pretty healthy, then if you're working with psychedelics for the first time, still have a sitter, a guide, someone who can at least take care of you, who can hold your hand, who can ensure that you're safe. You know, all those sorts of things are also important. 
Very important. Okay. So you've got a lot of information about this on your website and you've been that's now with obviously with COVID, you aren't doing it in person. So what is what if people want to know more, how can they find out more? And are you offering courses? I mean, you're doing that microdosing course you mentioned. Yeah. So the third wave dot co. Okay. So we'll put that into the show wave notes. Dot co. And that's our educational platform on responsible and intentional psychedelic use. You can find guides to every psychedelic. We have a podcast where I've interviewed medical doctors, neuroscientists, researchers, entrepreneurs, writers, you know, the whole gamut of people. So there's a podcast that they can learn more. We also, like I said, I mentioned the synthesis, that's synthesisretreat.com. So those are legal psilocybin experiences that you can go to. And then with Third Wave, we have our microdosing course, including a live six-week group coaching process where we bring people through the two weeks of prep, the breakthrough experience with breath work, and then the four weeks of integration coaching with microdosing. And then I also... So is that done online? Is that done via... It's done online right now. Okay. Yep. Everything we're doing is, is through Zoom. And then I also offer personalized coaching. So I help people through this process more so for those who are interested in creativity, you know, better clarity about the professional pursuit, accessing more states of flow, right? I'm not a clinical professional. I'm not a medical professional. I'm not a medical doctor. It's more like on a coach do, level. On but a coach I do level. offer coaching on, on preparation and integration. And so people can find out more information about that at my personal website, which is paulaustin.co. Fantastic. We'll put all those those links in the show notes. I have a couple more quick questions. The first one, mm-hmm. and we, these are big topics, so we may maybe want to do another podcast about them. But just in yeah. terms of the, I want to know about like epigenetics because my audience is quite familiar with the concept of epigenetics. And you interviewed mm-hmm. Doctor, can't remember his name now, David very, Rabin. Yes, about the, and that particularly interested me in terms of because you go into the whole epigenetics and how it passes through generations. So trauma, so my audience is familiar with the concept of epigenetics and how trauma can pass through generations and how epigenetics is the factor over and above the gene. So it's the methyl and acetyl donors. In other words, it's the chemical side, but it's basically the things that switch the genes on and off and make the protein. So that's a nice, simple explanation. And the what's interesting is the, the psychedelics are working right down at that level of influencing epigenetic level, helping to change mm-hmm. things and change that trauma in gener- so generation trauma that seems mm-hmm. to be his work that doctor that you the psychiatrist that you interviewed and, and he yeah, talks and a little so, bit about how it works at synapses so i don't know if you can give that very simplistically you can give a little i'll give a very sort of nice scientific per- perspective just, on that it just brings a nice scientific angle to to something that may seem a little bit mystical but it's actually very scientific it does and so this the the work that he's specifically doing is on mdma for ptsd Yes. So they're, they're basically an adjunct to the phase three clinical trials that are currently going on. What they're doing is they're taking saliva samples before and after those experiences and then seeing and, and, and measuring how certain indicators have changed as a result of someone's MDMA experience. And that's specifically mm-hmm. because with scientific research, they've showed that on average, a person who has PTSD lives 17 years less yeah. than someone who does not. And that can be reflected in something like telomere length. Yes, so what I, I, I researched at, that in my clinical trials too, the telomere. Really? You, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's, that's so fascinating. And so what they're looking at is how MDMA can help. As MDMA helps to heal that PTSD, how does that impact and change something like telomere length or cortisol levels or the way that genes are are representing themselves, they might be getting into mitochondrial plasticity and ATP, you know, energy production and all those things as well. So that's just sort of like a brief little sort of context in terms of how mm-hmm. how they're looking at MDMA can help with, with that epigenetic process. It's fantastic. We found, I found in my clinical trials, myself and my team, I work with neurosurgeons and neuroscientists and whatever we do this clinical trial, we looked at one of the factors was was telomeres. And generally, you they as you, you probably know, it takes 
they used to think it takes five years for changes to take place, but you can see changes in as short as nine weeks. And we saw changes in as short as nine weeks. So we saw with mind management, we saw, and it's the conscious deliberate getting into the non-conscious and managing it. We saw a significant change in telomere length. So the increase in cellular health and a decrease in the ones in our control group where they had no mind management, but they brought all the trauma up. And this is, I wanted to say this because you, so when you said that you prepare, you go through the experience and then you've got the integration afterwards. That's so vital is that you can become aware, but if you don't do what you are aware of, if you don't do something with it, you're actually going to get worse. And we saw that with our trials. We saw the significant decrease in telomere length in the first three weeks, we started seeing the decrease and it continued to nine months and even at the six month point. So that's very interesting support for the integration process afterwards is we have to keep doing the work. And interestingly enough, the same problems happen with meditation, similar sort of problems. Meditation is incredible for also getting awareness, but if you don't have something to sustain, you can actually be be worse. You can be okay in that time period, but you can be worse afterwards. And you, you you mentioned similar things. You can't just crack open the door and then just let people float. You have to have some kind of a, a slow period of, of reintegration, which is so important. I like the way he explained as well in your in your podcast about how the at the you know the synapses, the serotonin, so our, the traditional antidepressants it's not precision medicine, it's all guesswork, but essentially they are overloading the synapses with serotonin and most people are familiar with that and that holds them it's a it's pretty much an unscientific myth i mean even harvard scientists will tell you that you can't say it's a serotonin imbalance but what it does do is it messes up the serotonin levels in terms of the, the antidepressants in terms of the receptors get damaged but psychedelics are doing the opposite so instead of it numbing good and bad and numbing and creating a general general anesthetic effect your ssris the psychedelics are actually changing that and improving it and allowing you to experience both, and not the next to do with the 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 HT the five what did you five HT two A receptor five HT two A instead of it being damaged, it's actually being activated and changed because the SSRIs damage the receptors. Well, and and Dave made a really interesting point in that podcast, which is also the five HT two A receptor. When that's activated, it's sort of the top of the meaning. How we make meaning? meaning out of yes, the world. yes, I love that. Yeah, and I, and I think that is the really important thing to pay attention to because all of a sudden it ties a very sort of reductionist neurochemical yes. element, which is just yes. serotonin receptors and five HT two A, to something much more metaphysical. Exactly. And, and 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 you know, one of my favorite philosophers is Nietzsche. And yeah. what Nietzsche spoke about at the end of the 19th century was because God is dead, that the core issue of the 20th century would be nihilism. Exactly. It would be a sense of, well, where do we no. find meaning in the There's world? No meaning. How do we yeah. create mm-hmm. meaning, right? Mm-hmm. Where does that come from? And so what I loved about Dave's point is if you look at all the mental health issues that are becoming worse and worse and worse and worse, it's because nihilism mean. has become so integrated that we've lost Meaning, we don't exactly. people don't know what to live for anymore. Exactly, you can't reduce so, people down to that just pure physical. Then it will be nihilism. You're going to lose the point of meaning, the meaning of life, the scientism of 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 you know industrial culture and you know all yeah, these sorts yeah, of things. So yeah, I think yeah. that was the beautiful sort of like Dave tying in this five HG two A receptor. That's how we make meaning, and that's why psychedelics are so incredible. Is because they help us to realize that we are here to weave our own path and to infuse meaning into our existence. I love that. In other words, meaning doesn't come from some sort of external dogma or external directions, but we actually find meaning from within. Inside out, yeah. And it comes inside out. And then we infuse that meaning, those stories into the world around us. And that's what helps Mm. us feel like we're engaged in the world around us we, we were connected to the world around us because we actually feel as if our behavior and our actions are influencing. And I think that's what provides like, like so many people, for example, who are stuck in corporate jobs or whatever, they're just like, I have no agency, I have no freedom, I have no choice. And the biggest thing that psychedelics do is they help people recognize that I have a choice. I have a choice Mm -hmm. to heal my depression. I have a choice to heal my addiction. I have a choice to heal the anxiety. I have a choice to choose a new job. I have a choice to have a new relationship. I've name it again and again and again. It gives people agency. I love that. That's what helps them find meaning is to give people agency, give people their power back. So they realize that they have 
responsibility and can make something of their existence. I totally agree with you. I love that. I love how you've said that. And I totally agree. And one of the things you find in my clinical trials is the pathway to empowerment, which is you give someone awareness. As soon as you give them awareness, you've got to give them autonomy. And that's what you say. As soon as they have autonomy, then they say, okay, I can face the barriers. I can face the challenges. I can do something with these toxic issues in my life. I can manage this toxic. And it's that feeling that shifts the, that shifts the, the curve. And we saw, which is you may find very interesting in terms of getting out of just the chemical realm with dealing with serotonin, et cetera, we can move into the energy level of the theta, delta, alpha, beta, because I use QEEG technology. And we could see like when people were making the shifts in learning, when they started, they, 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 was, they were facing the pain. They were, they were de- even more depressed, but they were also at peace. And we saw gamma peaks. So we saw which shows neuroplasticity, peaks in gamma, which shows that learning and integration and deep stuff, we would see delta increasing. And when delta increases during the day, you with gamma, you actually are getting in touch with your spiritual nature. And when you get things like theta increasing, and you'll see also the serotonin changes, and you'll see the cortisol changes, you'll see that all of those kind of correlate, people are actually finding that meaning. So we were looking quite interestingly at all these neuro, from my psych, physiological, neurophysiological, and seeing that pattern happening with mind management. So psychedelics is just adding another layer to help people to get there and to crack through that, get the clouds parted, as you said earlier on. So this is a great discussion. I can go these. I wanted to ask I could you go. I could go on I and know, on and on I know. And we've been going for ages. <laughs> Maybe we could just quickly, quickly, quickly and really fast because this is a question we get a lot of. And that's just cover ketamine, which is the molecule one, which is being used, in my opinion, incorrectly as an antidepressant over a long period of time. And the ketamine mm-hmm. infusions for postnatal depression and, and mm-hmm. uh, that kind of stuff, which is really dangerous. Those studies have shown a lot of problems in the clinical Mm -hmm. trials when you look at what's Mm -hmm. actually happened. But you using it differently as a psychedelic. Can you just briefly explain that, you know, that how it's different as a psychedelic versus as a ongoing medication, either through inhalation, which is just long term, the stuff is pretty dangerous. So ketamine is a disassociative. It's typically known as an anesthetic, right? It's been it's used in hospitals all over the world. It's it's a very commonly Mm -hmm. accepted drug. And they recently find out found out that it has an incredible antidepressant effect. So for suicidal ideation, there's basically nothing better than ketamine. So if someone is, you know, they're ideating, that's a great thing to give. Now, the issue with the current model is the ketamine infusions. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's within sort of the current medical model, which is come in for an infusion, two weeks later, do another one, two mm-hmm. weeks later, do another one, two weeks, you know, it's just kind of yeah. sort of like a repeat of that. And so what we're seeing more and more and more is instead of the infusion model, there are a lot of psychiatrists who are opening up integrative ketamine clinics where they're combining ketamine with things like body work. So I had my own experience where I did ketamine with a world-class body worker. And what's great about body work is you can get into unconscious trauma that is held in the somatic body. Mm-hmm. And that's Which what ketamine there. is. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. What, that's what ketamine is so great for is it cuts out the ego totally. The mind totally shuts off. It's just like quiet, yeah, which is sort of like... That's, yeah, that's what an anesthetic does. It makes it unconscious. So the mind exactly. goes into an unconscious state. Yeah. And so when that happens, then when you combine it with something like body work, it's so much easier to get into parts mm-hmm. of the body that normally put up resistance in a conscious state. Yeah. Because memories so also in your body as well. Yeah. Okay. So it's phenomenal as an adjunct for specific modalities. But I think that's what's key when looking at ketamine therapy. Because ketamine therapy, when it's combined with talk therapy or body work or other stuff, can be just as effective as regular psychedelic therapy. But it's so critical that it's used not as an ongoing medication, but as a high, like middle to high dose, whether that's IV or IM Mm -hmm. or, you know, sublingual now. There Mm -hmm. there are sublingual doses that you can take. But it's so critical that, again, it's used, used within that preparation experience an integration framework. It's, so it's not just a drug. A, okay. It's a catalyst. And so you can use it within that psychedelic framework and it's incredibly effective. Okay. That makes so much sense. And thank you. I'm so glad we did cover that because it's really is a, it's, it's being used incorrectly, but used as a psychedelic drug. It can actually have a very good dissociative effect because memories are stored in your mind, your, in your mind, in your brain and in your body. So that's one. Okay. That's fantastic. Well, thank you so much. Well, we, we'll have to have another conversation because I feel like, Caroline. yeah, it's been amazing. Thank you so much for your wisdom and your input. And we'll put all your links in the show notes and thank you so much. It's been so great getting to know you and and having this absolutely fascinating discussion.
And thank you for hosting this podcast and bringing this information and knowledge. I think these are such important medicines and uh, I just really appreciate you having me on the show. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much.